And joining us now on the debate for the full hour tonight, Peter Cormos, New Democrat, MPP for the riding of Welland. Peter P. Constantino, professor at the management program at the University of Toronto, Scarborough. Nelson Wiseman, professor of political science at the University of Toronto, downtown. John Matheson, principal at the government relations firm Strategy Corp. And Adam Radwanski, Queen's Park columnist at the Globe and Mail. And tonight is a Your Agenda Thursday where you're invited to take part in the discussion. So you can reach us by email at theagenda at tvo.org, on Twitter at twitter.com, hashtag your agenda, or on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash the agenda. And as always, our fifth column blogger, Mike Miner, is hosting a live chat on our Inside Agenda blog. That's on our homepage, tvo.org slash the agenda, and on the Facebook page, facebook.com slash the agenda. So many ways for you to jump in and join the debate. And it's good to have all of you around this table this evening for a discussion that is very timely, given what's been going on at Queen's Park the last little while. Adam. Why are we talking about this now? Well, we're talking about it probably in part because the opposition was smart and you've got a late second term government and it's managed to bring up uh, the lobbying issue, uh, particularly public agencies uh, using public money to lobby the government as a way to show that this government is, is beholden to insiders and has sort of second term disease. Yesterday, the Auditor General brought out his report. He investigates many different aspects of government, including now hospitals. What did he find out? His focus actually wasn't primarily on lobbyists. It was mostly on consultants. So there's a kind of a blurry line between the two. Uh, what he basically found was a lot of practices that people thought might be stamped out uh, following the e-health uh, scandal uh, last year, uh, particularly sole source contracts, some, some dubious expenses. But he also found relevant to this, uh, half the hospitals he looked at were uh, paying lobbyists to lobby the government. And the government, being the clever folks they are, decided on the very same day to come out with a new bill stamping out lobbying. What's that all about? Well, sort of. I mean, what they've, done, of, right. yeah. <laughs> what they've done primarily, uh, what the bill does some other things too, but what it primarily does is it, it bans using taxpayer money, uh, which is a little bit confusing because hospitals don't rely entirely on uh, taxpayer money, but it bans public agencies from using that money uh, to lobby the government. Okay. John, what are you? I'm a lobbyist. You are. You fess up to that. I absolutely. What do you do? Well, you know, government relations consultants are kind of like uh, tour guides to a government for their clients. Government is more complicated than ever. Uh, jurisdictions all over the Western world have found that because of the multiplication of legislation, the multiplication of regulations, the multiplication of rules of all sorts, and just the general complexity and interrelationships and things, they've found that increasingly, just like you need a lawyer to go to court, Increasingly, if you're going to have an effective interrelationship with government, you need to be able to have people who can guide you through the process. And so that's really what we do. Peter Cormos, you've been inside. You were a cabinet minister 20 years ago. You know what it's like to try to deal through all of the machinations of government. You know what he does. Is there anything that he does that's so bad for our democracy? Well, look, the issue here is that scarce taxpayer dollars, especially in, in areas like, like hospitals and health care, where, where people are, are, are waiting in hallways to get access to emergency treatment, those scarce health care dollars is being spent on lobbyists when, when the minister herself, and the minister, I, I gotta tell you, Deb Matthews, insists that she had no knowledge that any of this was going on. She, she was very much like, like the, the piano player in the brothel who wants to pretend that she doesn't know what's going on upstairs. Uh, so, so she's shocked and, and horrified at, at all these lobbyists being paid for with taxpayer dollars. I mean, she says, my God, my phone, just call me. Please call me. You don't have to hire a lobbyist. So who am I to say no? The other Peter, let me try this with you. Are things so complicated that even hospitals, which theoretically the CEO can pick up the phone. I would think the CEO of Sick Kids Hospital could pick up the phone and get the Minister of Health most, you know, nine times on ten. You've studied this. How many hospital CEOs and or people inside the post-secondary um, education sector did you talk to for the PhD study you did on this? My study looked at colleges and universities exclusively and I interviewed roughly half of the presidents of colleges and universities, the deputies, the ADMs, former ministers of all parties. And I asked them, what is it you do and why do you do it? And what I learned from them were really three things. Government is indeed that complicated in a hypersensitive environment. Programs are increasingly marketized, which means they incent competition. So there isn't a call for proposals that everyone knows about such that they would then submit a, a, a proposal. There isn't a formula that then uh, just distributes uh, buildings based on enrollment-based uh, numbers. It's the Wild West. So if they don't have some guidance and they don't get a sense for what the government's looking for and how to partner, they're at a real disadvantage. The third thing is that um, the truth is there's a diminished policy capacity within government. So uh, industries, 
associations and institutions are having to provide information so that governments can make informed decisions. And the, really the public's impression is that there are tens of thousands of civil servants out there who, whose job it is to get good information to ministers so they can make good decisions. And you're saying even with those tens of thousands of employees, it's not happening? Although there are, you know, government hasn't grown so much in size, what it does, how it does it, and the nature of the partnerships that engage in are more complicated. So the nuances of providing things like education or health care are constantly changing, rapidly changing, and keeping up is a, is a full-time job. Okay, Nelson, we're hearing that it, this is so complicated nowadays that even hospitals, even big hospitals, one subway stop away from Queen's Park need to hire government relations experts slash lobbyists in order to move their files forward. What do you say to that? I say there's something pernicious and unseemly about this arrangement where one part of the public sector has to hire the private sector to lobby another part of the public sector, a part that appoints it to which it's responsible to. It tells me that something isn't working here. We're told government is more complex. We have more people working in government than ever before, yet we're told we hear from Peter the policy capacity is reduced. It seems to me hospitals, universities have officers whose responsibility it is to deal with the community, to deal with government. Uh, they should be able to pick up a phone once they get a bureaucrat. That bureaucrat presumably knows who else in the government they can contact. The minister staff can direct them to where to go. How about their local MPP? Does he or she not have an interest in that hospital or college in their community? Okay, here's a few options that Nelson says ought to be pursued before somebody calls uh, John Matheson on the phone. Is that accurate? What do you say? Well, I think what it's really missing, Nelson, is what the lobbyist is actually doing. I mean, the, the, the choice that any public executive has, just speaking of public sector lobbying, is first they decide if they have a problem or not that needs attention. Then they decide whether or not they have the resources sufficient to deal with it. Then they decide to either hire somebody full time to deal with it, or they decide whether they need a consultant. And that's that last piece is just a business decision about how you can do it more efficiently. You yourself said uh, you put your finger on it. You said they have people who do that. Well, actually, little ones sometimes don't have people who do that. They they frequently don't have people who are say sophisticated in understanding the workings of the capital project budgets of the ministry or that sort of thing. And so they actually don't have a person. And so then, really, it's just a business choice whether the best thing to do is to hire a new VP of in-house institutional relations, which might cost you a few hundred thousand dollars by the time all is in, or whether you're going to hire a consultant. And, and that is, frankly, I think something that, uh, it, that's really the nub of what they're talking about in this legislation. Peter, you're from not one of the huger cities in this province. Would you acknowledge that Maybe the local hospital in your riding needs a little extra help because it doesn't have its own in-house government relations horse staff? Feathers. Horse feathers. Uh, we're not talking about unorganized groups of people. We're not talking about novices. We're not talking about uh, gross power inequities here. We're talking about hospitals even to town in Niagara where CEOs are making uh, six, uh, big six-digit incomes and have huge staffs, huge bureaucracies of their own. Uh, you know, so, somebody, there's a scam going on here, quite frankly. Uh, first of all, governments, especially governments in power, sell uh, and, and raise money selling access to ministers and, and, and premiers, presumably with the understanding that you buy the $500 ticket, you get to schmooze Dalton McGinty or Tim Hudak or whatever and, and, and convey your, your interest to him or her, similarly with cabinet ministers. Uh, they, they insist that they, have, that they understand their, their, their partners in, in the much sector, in university schools, hospitals, municipalities. Uh, they've got conventions galore, you've got good roads, you've got all, and, and look, even small town Ontario is quite capable of having a, a CEO who can forge a relationship with ADMs and the bureaucracy, which quite frankly is far more relevant than forging a relationship with a political minister mm -hmm. or political staff. Let me follow that up with Peter Constantino. Mm -hmm. we've, we've heard, and Nelson said it a moment ago, we've heard, We've heard the Minister of Health say, look, it, if the local MPP wants to lobby me on behalf of the hospital, my door is always open. Does the local MPP have the expertise and the accessibility to these ministers to make that statement, in fact, accurate? I think what we want, and I start with the premise that a healthy democracy has a very engaged citizenry, and that means all of the various in in interests that exist, all of the organizations are, are competing in an arena trying to get on the government agenda. And so having organizations have some supports in articulating their ideas and views, whether it's a woman's shelter or a hospital. That's part of a healthy conversation. Governments want to engage with 
the folks that they're working with to try and deliver services, and they want to get programming, regulations, et cetera, right. So they reach out. They can't better organize uh, the sector than working with those institutions or those uh, industry associations. All right, Adam, I'm going to make you the referee here on this. Let's say Riding X has a local hospital. They want to get something, maybe a new MRI machine from the government. Who is more likely to move that file through to success, the local MPP or hiring Matheson? Depends a little who the MPP is. I mean, if they're, I hate to say this, if they're in a particularly sensitive riding, uh, they might have more success. If they're, if they're an incumbent in a sensitive riding, they might have more success uh, than they would if they were either somebody in a safe riding or an opposition MPP. Uh, I do think, I mean, it doesn't sound good to say this, but I suspect that some of the people who are doing the lobbying actually know the system better than the MPPs do, which is to say they know the ministries better than the MPPs do. That's not a reflection on all MPPs, uh, but I think when you come right out of government and you've kind of worked on that side of it, I actually think navigating all the intricacies there beyond just the legislature are actually pretty important. Yeah, is that accurate? I mean, the MPPs have a lot of stuff on their plate. You can't possibly oh. be as... Please. You can't be as expert in how to move a file through the Ministry of Health as this guy can be. Look, by the time you're there two, three years, one term, you should darn well know how to do it or else uh, let somebody else take your job over because there's a huge lineup uh, every four years. And I'm sorry, and one of the if, if you're an MPP at Queen's Park, opposition or not, and, and you have a profile of any sort whatsoever and some credibility, you can access ADMs and DMs. You can talk to the bureaucracy. And again, again that, that's the far more productive communication than is talking to political staffers because political staffers are, well, precisely that. Ministers don't make these policy decisions. At the end of the day, they, they have to sell it to cabinet, but DMs sell it to the premier's office before, because DMs are accountable not to the minister, but to the premier. Let's not forget that. We've got to ban these initials. Deputy ministers, deputy ministers, assistant my, my deputy apologies, ministers. My yeah. apologies. But deputy ministers are accountable to the premier, not to their minister. Understood. And, John, and, you wanted to come but, back. But, but you see, you know, the, my, my, my skeptical friend is, is really, he, he, he's pointing out exactly my point, which is it's not about picking up the phone and getting access. There isn't, let, let me say it for the record, there is not a single head of a, uh, a public entity that needs to hire a lobbyist to get a meeting with the relevant minister, okay? It's just, it simply isn't necessary. But frankly, that isn't what you're hiring government relations assistants for. The way you should think of it is just what Peter was saying a second ago. He said, it's not about just calling the minister. It's not just about getting the MPP support. Although that's hugely important. It's about sustaining contact across a whole breadth of places over time, knowing what to say when you get there, understanding the priorities of the government, making sure that you frame your, the thing that you're asking for in a way that the government can say yes to it. These are all very sophisticated things that have got a lot more in common with showing up at court with the proper documents than they have to do with picking up the phone and booking a court date. Peter, why does there. Deb Matthews, the Minister of Health, disagree with you so strongly? She's been very clear the last several days. She's horrified to learn that folks like you have been being paid out of the public purse to lobby Queen's Park. She's shocked. She's horrified. She says you're not necessary. She's insisting that public sector partners like uh, hospitals no longer pay for, for, for consultant lobbyists. So either well, you're, can, either, either can you're wrong or Ms. Here? Matthews Let, is wrong. Let's, oh. Adam Radwanski is going to tell you why, why she's shocked and appalled. Because we're less than a year from an election. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I do think that it is, I, mean, I agree with what Peter's saying that, that in a perfect world, um, or even not a perfect world, a, a pretty good world, MPPs should be able to represent those interests. But the fact is, for whatever reason, I mean, places like hospitals are spending on lobbyists. And they're not doing that because they're really dying to throw money away. And I, I don't think that they're all... Yes, there's bad apples in every sector, but I don't think that lobbyists are full of sort of guys walking around with paper bags of money handing it around. So there is some need there, and it seems to me that until that actual need is addressed, just setting some rules isn't going to achieve a whole lot. John. Well, let me put it to you this way. Uh, if the Premier of Ontario wants to get a meeting with the Prime Minister, who, you know, he reports to the Prime Minister, he's constitutionally junior to the Prime Minister, and... Well, what does he do? Yeah, he, junior in the sense of the, 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 the point is he has a Ministry of Intergovernmental Affairs. And when we have a uh, conversation between two governments, we understand that it's intergovernmental affairs. And when we have a conversation between the private sector and the government, we understand that it's lobbying. And what we're having is a hard time dealing with kind of two-dimensional terminology. And the two-dimensional terminology is when you're in the broader public sector, are you lobbying like the private sector or are you engaging in intergovernmental affairs? And the only point I would say is 
I don't disagree with Ms. Matthews, and she doesn't, it doesn't disagree with me. What she's saying is she doesn't want consultants doing it anymore, and that's precisely what her bill is going to achieve. But she's not saying that hospitals can't have in-house people doing it. And so this whole thing is really just a bit of much ado about nothing. Consultants won't be able to do the work anymore. In-house people will. But the conversation's going to still go on, just like Peter said. That's all. The work continues. It just who yeah, does it, where it's, they're, it's, and, and whether where and they put their the name only plan. thing that may be lost as a result of this is that if I can do it on a better or more efficient way for an institution because they don't have to hire somebody full time to do it, then that's actually something that the auditor general will probably complain about in a few years, and he'll say, "Boy, it's a shame you can't use those consultants." Let anymore. me hear from Nelson and then Peter. Well, first I want to deal with what I, I, I hear what uh, Peter and John are saying, but with respect, this analogy of. Uh, intergovernmental relations and comparing it to the province and, and para-public institutions does not hold. The Premier of Ontario is constitutionally equal in his area of jurisdiction to the Prime Minister of Canada. Those are two governments that are sovereign and deal with each other. But that's the but those, We're not going to get hold hung it, up on it's that. It's, it's, let it's, me it's, point it's, this out. But these agencies like universities and colleges and municipalities and schools and local health integration networks are part of one government. They're part of the provincial government. They're an extension of the government. They're creatures of the government. And what we have, not two things I want to point to. It's not just a matter that they need consultants or they need to know who to deal with in government. Where's the failure in this bureaucracy? If, if you call anyone in the Ministry of Health or in the minister's office, they should be able to tell you these are the steps you've got to go through. These are the relevant actors you have to touch base with. The other point we're not dealing with, and this is a political subtext, is many of these people that are selling their services as lobbyists, they don't have any particular expertise in health or higher education. What are they selling? Oh, well, they know people in the Premier's office because they were, in fact, involved in getting the Premier and that party elected. So the pers and, and when those people, the lobbyists, deal with the bureaucrat, the bureaucrat starts to think, gee, you know, this guy's on speaking well, terms with the this Premier. Out. Let me just I check don't this know out. him. There's, there's, presumably there's two ways to lobby. One is to go through the politicians and the other is to go through the civil service. It doesn't all happen by knocking on a politician's door, right? Some people do it that way, but others go through the civil service. Yeah. When I met with college presidents and university presidents, a lot of what they said was, we have to convince the public that the issue should be on the political agenda. We, we have to put advertising in bus shelters so that people start to think about our issues, so that when the politicians go door to door, or when they have a town hall, they'll say, I'm concerned that there might not be a spot for my child in college or university. And so a lot of what government relations as the president has described it, included were all of these things where they worked with third party endorsements in the community in building a momentum towards advancing ideas. Very little. It was among the last things that the president's mentioned that was on their activity sheet. Nelson, let me follow up with this. I have no doubt but that if David Naylor, the president of the University of Toronto, student population 60,000, something like that, uh, wanted to get the Minister of uh, post uh, Colleges and Universities, Training Colleges and Universities, or the Premier on the phone, he wouldn't have any trouble doing it. Yeah. My hunch is if you're representing Algonquin College or Confederation College, it might be a little tougher. Do they need a little extra help? Uh, I, I'm, I'm raising the issue, why do you have to get right to the Premier? A lot of these issues, as John points out, and, and Peter studies, are technical issues. You've got bureaucrats, you've got units within the government who are responsible for liaising with Algonquin College and, and other institutions, public institutions, either in that area or in that type of sector. John, try again. You haven't sold them yet. Well, you're right. And you know what? I don't believe that in my f almost 15 years of work that I've ever actually telephoned the pre any premier about anything because that's not the most effective way of advocacy. You, you bring in the politicians, typically, sometime near the beginning to say this is coming along and it's of interest and you bring them at the end to hopefully to, 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 to endorse it but through the middle all the difficult work of 
preparing the arguments and figuring out where the fit is with government, it's all done at the staff level, whether it's the political staff or whether it's the public servants. Is, 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 frankly, it's, it's, it's find, find the right person for the job. And so you, you're quite right. You don't need that level of access. But that's not what people are buying. Peter Constantino. We were working with a whole bunch of uh, presidents who said they were partnering with not-for-profit organizations in trying to work together to solve problems that were on the government's agenda. And a lot of those not-for-profit organizations said, I can no longer afford to take government money because the reporting requirements were so onerous. And so now you've got people that have to be hired within these colleges and universities simply to, to manage the requirements of the relationship. So reporting, understanding, uh, m going to meetings, all of those things that are just part of doing work together as partners. Let me raise another angle on this story. Here's, uh, sorry to do this, uh, uh, Toronto Star, going to quote here for a second. But, you know, Jimmy Coyle wrote about this right. this morning too. Uh, Michael, page two, graphic if we could. How is it these organizations perceive decision makers as so inaccessible, so unavailable that they need to hire guns uh, to make their case? It's a culture that has grown not just under this government but under administrations of all political stripes. The broader question would require not just Health Minister Deb Matthews but the Premier to consider how remote they have become and how insulated they appear to be even by hospital administrators. Adam, is accessibility to politicians a problem? Sure, but it's also accessibility to bureaucrats. Uh, I mean, that's, they're always going to be, I mean, the politicians are never going to run their ministries entirely. I mean, that's just not going to happen. They're, they come in often with a little expertise in that field. Uh, they step in, they're not going to know, Dead Matthews is not going to know the ins and outs of every hospital in the province. Just, it, it's not possible. Um, I think Nelson raised an important point a moment ago, um, which is that, yes, it probably should be up to bureaucrats to reach out a little more. First of all, for the government to simplify that process. Uh, and for bureaucrats to reach out a little more, maybe for, for governments to reach out and educate people on how they deal with government and all of those things. Um, and that has to be done at some point. I guess what I come back to is that the solution that the government's come up with is woefully inadequate because it doesn't change the culture of it. It just basically says, well, you can't hire these guys in this way anymore. They're still going to have to do it. And to say, well, you don't, I'm not going to take calls from lobbyists anymore. Uh, hospital CEOs can call me on the phone. That's not going to solve much unless you can have them also feel comfortable or their people feel comfortable calling the right people in the bureaucracy. John. Well, you know, that's, that's the really important point because what you want is for all these organizations to be working together effectively. But, you know, uh, public administration is a bit like gardening, right? You do all the weeding in May, and what's that mean? Well, it means you get to do it again in June. And there's, things are constantly evolving. They're constantly changing. Uh, people wind up, uh, one, of the, one of the constant curses in trying to maintain an institutional relationship is the constant changeover in staff, whether it be at the public servant level or whether it be in the, in the minister's office. It means that the job is never done. And so like a, a typical rule of thumb with us is that you can expect about a 60 to 70 percent turnover in the people who you're dealing with mm. if you have a project that has a duration of greater than 18 months. In which we, case, it'll take longer and longer well, and longer. Well, yeah, but what yeah. that really means is you're, you have to be constantly staying on top of the way things are changing. And in the environment when there's so, so much of a, a requirement for uh, key performance indicators, which is the big buzzword, the way in which these get applied to wildly differently sized institutions, you were talking about the difference between, say, a big place like U of T and then one of the smaller universities. If you're one of these poor public servants, try and figure out how to figure out what the right benchmark is that applies mm -hmm. evenly to such wildly different institutions. Let me ask Peter Cormos about this. When you were in government 20 years ago, yes. did you ever get lobbied by hospitals well, or post-secondary institutions? Of course. We still get lobbied. How'd you MPPs get lobbied. Well, you say thank you very much, and, and, and you, you have a glass of wine and, and, and some, some dried up cheese from the cheese tray. Um, look, you can't have it both ways. Uh, on the one hand, there's the suggestion here that, that in some respects it's not rocket science, it's just that one extra person and perhaps a small team that, 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 that greases the wheels. On the other hand, uh, people like voters, like taxpayers, are, are disgusted with the revelations that were made over the last couple of weeks. They're shocked, they're outraged. Well, and, the and I agree that the legislation is written so that it will convert uh, consultant lobbyists on retainer into in-house lobbyists, but I'll tell you that all that means is that a year from now, the New Democrats will be using their FOI power with with, with hospitals. Freedom of information. Freedom of freedom of information. Very good for you. <laughs> You're right. But using I'm trying to stay on top of your acronyms. Tonight, using, using freedom of information uh, to access hospital budgets, and we'll be blowing the whistles on hospitals that dare to hire two hundred fifty thousand dollar a year government relations people me, rather than nurses and and and, and doctors okay, and but, cleaning people. But let me follow up on that, Adam. Is, is it fair to say, you tell me, that the money that hospitals or post-secondary institutions have used 
to lobby government, mm -hmm. to advance their files. We don't really know if it's taxpayers' money, do we? I mean, it could be money they get from the parking garage. Is, it's a from, catch. This mm -hmm. is a catch. Um, because about, I think it's about 85% is, is government funded and about 15% is stuff like parking. Uh, so technically, this legislation doesn't really prevent them from doing it. That being said, I would be pretty shocked if any of the hospitals or any of the other public institutions right now actually engaged uh, a registered lobbyist for them because after this particular attention with what Dead Matthew said yesterday, I just don't think it's going to happen. Okay, I think keep this email, sorry to cut you off, but this email just came up and uh, John Matheson, I want you to have a chance to speak to it. When I hear the word lobbyist, Frank P. says, I hear influence peddling. When I hear influence peddling, I smell corruption. I have a suspicious mind when business interests and politicians get together. That's out there. What do you want to say to Frank? Well, firstly, Frank, influence peddling is actually what the official does. If you look it up sometime in the, crit in the criminal code, it's when somebody who's a f an official sells their influence. Lobbyists don't sell access. I've already said that. What we sell is expertise in government. We don't sell access any more than a lawyer sells access to the courts. What we sell is what you say when you get there, how you comport yourself while you're there, how you design your affairs so that you become compliant. So his email really speaks more to what he sees as it's a, a different, lack it's, of trust it's, in politics. It's, it's a different thing, yeah. Hmm. I, but I don't mean to be a smarty pants about what the words mean, yeah. but nobody's selling access when there's being a government relations. Peter Corbell? So, the old, the old maxim, a, a good lawyer knows the law, an excellent lawyer knows the judge. And I'm not <laughs> suggesting that, that either of you two play the political card, but you know darn well that in your industry, uh, there are lobby firms that are identified as liberal ones, Tory ones, the, the big ones have liberal and Tory people, and you're darn right, they, they sell access. And whether they, whether they do it in, in, in effect, in fact, or, or whether it's simply the wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and the marketing tool that they, they get to convince any number of clients to, to pay their fees uh, is, is irrelevant. They sell the fact that, hey, uh, we've got a guy who's the former chief of staff to the premier. You need him on your team if you're going to get into the premier's office, because we all know that if the premier's office doesn't want something to happen, it doesn't happen. Uh, so so how, why do your colleagues use the, the, these political connections to, to, at the very least, market themselves? Maybe, that, maybe they're not particularly effective. I'm not saying they are, but they use it to market themselves, and they sure do, don't they? It's ironic you picked the, uh, the example of a former Chief of Staff to the Premier, because it was the former Chief of Staff to Premier Bob Ray, David Agnew, who I think got appointed the president of Seneca College, and I think by all accounts did a pretty good job. He, his, his, his inside knowledge of how government works probably helped Seneca do better. And he didn't peddle himself as a lobbyist. No, he, he was the president, That's so right. he was in-house, so you're yeah, okay with yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. Well, no, he's the Nelson, one quick word, and then I'm going to go, go, go check with Mike Miner. Well, you want a last word well, on this? Well, we've just heard a lot of things uh, informative that I find a bit disturbing from a public administration point of view. Notions such as we have to incentivize that institutions are played off against each other, that public institutions have to advertise to try to change public attitudes. It's relating to citizens, not as citizens, but as customers. And what's happened, and we hear from John about the turnover and personnel, it's very sad that we now don't respect people that have policy expertise that have been, let's say, in a Department of Agriculture or Ministry for 15 years, and we relate to them strictly as managers, and there's no institutional memory. And John, it's happening with ministers, one too. Quick word but, but you're, to you're right. I mean, one of, the, one of the, the lack of institutional memory is a real problem. But uh, I actually would tend to look at it in a slightly more hopeful way, which is I think that the government delivers better service now than it did 20 years ago. I think that the way in which it measures and it holds itself to account is better. I think it's wonderful when the Auditor General comes along and gives a part of the system a good boot in the behind and says you got to do better. We'll all benefit from those sorts of improvements. But it's the fact of change that means that you're either up on the change or you're not. And if the, the, the one real advantage that government relations consultants can have that can bring value to their clients is expertise from having been down the same path before for somebody else. Gotcha. And okay. That's let's, the big thing. Let's do this. Uh, Michael Smith, ha let's get Janet Ecker's uh, quote standing by. We'll go to that right after we uh, go to an undisclosed location somewhere in this building to uh, talk to our good friend Mike Miner, who's monitoring the online chat tonight. Mike, what's everybody saying? Well, there is a lot of that suspicion of influence peddling, those, those that, that just kind of mistrust when business interests and uh, government get together. You do hear that. We have Duff Conacher online mm -hmm. of Democracy Watch. He's sort of leading the anti-lobby lobby on our chat. Uh, he says it's a good idea to prohibit public entities from hiring consultant lobbyists. Uh, and he thinks that the act in question uh, to address this situation should be renamed the Some Lobbyist Registering Some Lobbying and Restricting Only a Bit of Lobbying Act. We have uh, Mark online saying that uh, 
uh, lobbyists do serve a purpose, and there are a lot of people saying this as well. He says complex systems require navigators. If you remove the lobbyists, you're just going to slow down the process, and the only people who will get the ear of the government are the myriad of private sector lobbyists who already have too much influence on government policy. Uh, Mike Minor fan says that uh, that's a real name. I didn't make this up. Uh, <laughs> sure, sure. Seriously, yeah. look, look at the chat. Um, <laughs> he says that you know most of these organizations have internal positions, and what people are upset is you know they go outside to get people who presumably can do this job particularly well, and uh, people are just mad about the the optics of it, and it's not really a concern. We have Faith in here who once worked in government. She said it, she wishes she had a dime for all the time that. Uh, was wasted by people and organizations who were creating and providing useless information to the wrong people at the wrong time, and that a good government relations team really ups the efficiency and uh, is, a, is a great benefit to the system. Okay, thanks, Mike. We just let everybody know we're a little past 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. Mike is monitoring the online chat on our homepage, tvo.org slash the agenda. So if you want to participate, dial us up, give us your comments, and we'll, uh, if possible, put them up on the screen during the course of this. Okay, let's do this. Uh, Janet Ecker follows this program a little bit. You all know her, the former Ontario Finance Minister, and when she heard what tonight's program is about, she sent me this email, and uh, I asked her if she wouldn't mind if I shared it with you and our viewers, and she said, okay, so here we go, if we could. A good government relations professional is a broker. The person can be just as useful for the government and the stakeholder in developing the solution, compromise, or brokering a deal to solve a problem. You need them the same reason you hire other professional consultants and advisors like lawyers. Most people outside government do not know or understand government, as it is not their business. Most government people, from bureaucrats to politicians, do not know as much about an issue, business, or cause as the person doing it. The government relations person helps make the connection, and when it works well, it produces good public policy. Now, Peter Cormos, that's from somebody who's been both inside yep. as a minister and outside yep. as a lobbyist. And, and, she wouldn't and, like me and, using and that. And who I respect. And whom you respect. And like, yeah. So is she wrong? No, she's not wrong, but she's not right either. Uh, look, you have, you, have, you have organizations, I mean, every day is a lobby day at Queen's Park in, ter in terms of, of, of the grassroots lobbying. I'm not talking about the sophisticated bureaucratic lobbying, uh, I'm talking grassroots, like whether it's the Ontario Real Estate uh, Dealers Association or the Insurance Bureau of Canada, and they have their little wine and cheese soiree in the dining room, and they visit MPPs and they give them little kits uh, and, and create just huge backups in, in the blue boxes and, and the recycling uh, and the recycling bins, and those people can be reasonably valuable from the point of view of, of conveying information from, let's say, the Insurance Bureau of Canada about their particular issues. Most of the time, I don't think they need lobbyists to do that work. It's pretty, you know, it's 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 it's, it's pretty much no-brainers. Uh, and I've encouraged people to ditch the lobbyists uh, doing that work because oftentimes, sitting in my house, the lobbyist is simply getting in the way because the lobbyist knows less about the insurance industry than the insurance industry itself. Okay, so tell me this though: that, when when that, you that, 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 is, when is they do that thing. Is, when they do those evenings and they have a wine yeah. and cheese and they want you to come and drink their wine and they give you a little goodie bag at the end of the day, do, do, does that really influence how you feel about any issue? It doesn't influence me. Okay, uh, there's 106 others down there. there. Do you think it influences I, I, them? Most of them, I, I suspect not, there's, which is why I say they're, they're incredibly... So then it's they're, harmless. They're no, they're, it's wasteful. Because if the private sector wants to do it, God bless. Uh, but when the public sector or nonprofits transfer payment agencies, because they do it too, and it's a sucker shot. It's wasted money. It's to no end, to no avail. And again, whether it's the March of Dimes or the Canadian Cancer Society, uh, they're, they're spending donors' money in this case, not taxpayers' money, donors' money, with very little net effect, well, just, net, right, net, net result. Peter Constantino, just uh, again, because Peter Cormos raised it, if it's the real estate association and they want to throw a wine and cheese and get a bunch of MPPs to show up, drink their wine, eat their cheese, and get a goodie bag at the end of the day, and Peter says it probably has no influence at all on whether people want to support the organization or not, what's the harm? There, there is none. I think what we want to see is a system that has transparency, where we know who's talking to whom about what. And I have more faith in the public uh, sector than, uh, than most do. I think that there are enough checks and balances in there. Fill that, that out. No what does that mean we need to know who's meeting whom about what? Do I you see that up on the internet? I think that's what the, the registry does, uh, that we know that people are registered. We know who's registered to lobby. We don't know necessarily what time of day, in what office, with which official that they're meeting with. Do we need to know that? I don't think so. I, I mean, I like the fact there's a freedom of information uh, legislation and regime out there that means that if someone wants to FOI the, the date book or the phone log for a chief of staff, they can. But for the most part, those are, are silly games that the opposition often plays. Adam, you want to go that far? Uh, well, I was going to say, I have some faith in, uh, in the government. I don't, think, I don't think we generally have a corrupt government. But in terms of the transparency of it, I'm not sure we're there yet. 
uh, one of the problems with the registry is that it's largely voluntary. I mean, it's largely up to the lobbyist to register. And that can leave, it can lead to a lot, I mean, Matt, it, there's also, like a, well, there's <laughs> a very thin line between lobbying, consulting, what exactly it means. And I mean, at your firm, you're registered, so I'm not, are, I'm not, I'm are, not talking about you. We are scrupulous. Yes, and, and we but don't not think everybody of it, is. When we don't think of it as voluntary, we think of it as strictly mandatory mm -hmm. and compulsory and, I, and, and, but you know what, like, I don't mean to sound like I'm disagreeing with you. The, the, the rules are mandatory, whether everybody complies or not. I don't know. Well, that's the point. But, but, yeah. and, uh, but anybody who is on the registered side of the business is going to tend to be supportive of further measures towards transparency, Let me fill, as long as they're not just bureaucratic. Can we mm -hmm. figure that out, John? Let's figure that out right now, because we live in an age of hyper accountability and transparency mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. Hyper. Would you object, or do you think people in your industry would object to the idea of putting up on the internet for all to see what minister you're meeting on such and such a day at such and such a time and talking about such and such an issue? Uh, I think uh, uh, right now in Ottawa, we already have to disclose who we met with. I think just from a point of view of safety and security, it would make a lot more sense to have a retrospective view than a prospective one that you're talking about. So no, I don't, I don't think that would be very sensible, but the whole point is we already have a world where within 45 days of, uh, uh, of, of the meeting, you have to post it federally anyway, so or 15 days of the end of the month. So every, every 45 days, you have to make another return. So. Nelson. One of the issues that Adam raised in his column was that, well, in the end of the day, if, if these institutions, parapublic institutions, don't hire lobbyists and the system is so complex, they're going to have to hire in-house people, as John points out, and it's a business decision. But I think that's infinitely stronger because I'm, I feel very uncomfortable when I see lobbyists who we know have been involved in shaping, molding, directing, political parties' campaigns, then meeting bureaucrats who are easily intimidated by the fact that whether or not John has ever called the Premier directly, they know that John knows the Premier and his group uh, m m uh, was involved. If that were to cost more, that, would that be a problem for you? Well, because it probably would cost more to have them in-house than, than just to hire them on an as-needs basis. No, be, well, it depends because they might be doing other things. I don't believe that the only, the only job is just dealing with the government. There are other groups in the community. Part of um, being the external affairs president of a university doesn't mean you just deal with the government. Sometimes that might take more attention. Other times you might be dealing with student groups or other universities. Peter Constantino, you want to come back on that? I, I, I sat down with those presidents and asked them uh, what, what was the reason for doing this. And most of the time they said because they couldn't afford to have someone full time or that their needs changed. So today they were interested in getting public support for a new building. And tomorrow they needed some community assistance in rallying to support another type of project. And so as the new economy changes, where we don't necessarily hire employees permanently for life, but rather we hire talent on an as-needed basis, we're starting to see this in other sectors. It's such a sub-specialization now that you hire it when you need it, and they're gone when you don't. John. Yeah. And I think, too, when you think about it, if you've got somebody who's on mat leave, if you have a special project, if you have, say, a, a new hospital CEO who's just come in from British Columbia, who's used to the British Columbia rules and who doesn't have, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why you might want something short term. The, the thing about the government's choice in this legislation is they've chose to just simply ban it rather than leaving it to the board and to the CEO to figure out whether it makes sense in the circumstance. And that's a little bit inflexible. Adam. Uh, to Nelson's point uh, about uh, hiring people in-house, I do think one thing there is, that there's no guarantee those aren't insiders too. I mean, I think if you were to look at a lot of the big universities or mid-sized universities in the province, they have people on staff whose names you would recognize from working in government. So there's no, not necessarily a way to avoid that. I mean, the way if you want to, you can do a longer freeze. Right now there's, there's I think, a one-year freeze between lobbying and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, on a particular issue. Uh, federally, of course, there's a five-year freeze on doing any lobbying. That is an option. You can do that. I don't think it's worked well in Ottawa, but if you're really concerned about people from the current government, as opposed to past governments using their relationships, trading on them. Uh, that's probably the way to stop it, but I think that probably creates more problems than solves. Peter, let me bring you back in, Peter. Um, we just had a, a graphic come up on the screen here with somebody saying, wait a second, I thought hospitals reported to local health integration networks. So why are hospitals lobbying government directly? Shouldn't the LINs be doing that for them? There it is right there. 
Why are hospitals circumventing this avenue to have their needs or concerns heard by government? Well, in the end, the uh, provincial government sets the uh, budget envelope for uh, so many sectors that uh, it's, it's about ensuring that they realize that the nature of the practice is changing, that the needs of the community are uh, changing and expanding, and that they need to be uh, in tune with those demands. One more, John? Well. I don't want to cast aspersions about the effectiveness of LINs and their specific funding formulas, but I do recall back when there was another government and we tried to have a funding formula for school boards, I do recall everybody saying, boy, that one-size-fits-all funding formula just doesn't work for anybody. And so there was an awful lot of efforts to change it. And I think, you know, it, it should be understandable that while there may not have been as much fuss about it, as it's been applied to the hospitals just recently, I do think there's a lot of teething trouble and a lot of you know, difficulties that people are finding. Peter Cormos, let me ask you this. I think everybody agrees that the optics on all of this, you know, whether it was good public policy, whether it was effective, the optics were bad. The, the notion of hiring somebody Horrible. with the tax dollars to get more tax dollars for you. Having said that, lobbying has always been with us. Always. You and by passing- Well, I'm gonna name a few other vices. Uh, <laughs> this, one, on, this one's protected on. by the Magna Carta. Yeah, yeah. come on, right? come the on. Magna Look, Carta. But, but we're, missing, we're, but, we're missing the point here. Uh, the point is we're not talking about private sector, we're talking about public sector, public dollars. We're talking about, as, as Professor Wiseman says, effectively uh, uh, partners or subordinates, if you, if you will, of the provincial government. It, the, problem that if it, the problem appears then to be that government isn't as accessible as it says that it is. I mean, the premier and, and, and the, the, his ministers will want people to think they're accessible. Well, maybe if that, that means you have to fix government and make it more accessible. End of story. There shouldn't be a need for, 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 for government relations people when other governmental agencies that are part and parcel of, of, of uh, uh, legislatively the products of the province, there shouldn't be a need for, 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 for mediators, for interlocutors, should there? Peter. I've, in all the systems I've studied, I've never found a system as open as ours. It has nothing to do with access. It has to do with managing a relationship between institutions that are partnering now. We don't, we used to deliver government in government. Now we use partnerships and, and P3s and all kinds of other relationships. All of those things are new ways of doing business. So it's not about being able to call or meet. That has nothing to do with it. It's such a small part. Think about this. You were a cabinet minister. Did you ever lobby your finance minister for something and not get it? Surely to God, a cabinet minister should be able to get what he wants if he puts his mind to it. Uh, There's Peter, intramural Peter, lobbying. He probably, didn't, probably didn't go hire a Peter. private sector firm to lobby the finance Peter. minister. But I, I thought they were the ones we should go to if, uh, if the sector or any sector is interested in having their interests no. heard. Government, government should be designed so that people can access it, so that it's partners, as you, you mm -hmm. point out, can access it meaningfully without the need of mediators, mm -hmm. without the need of, 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 of pay, paid, pay, paid mediators. And, and that you people hold yourself out as some of being key, uh, critical, to the success of these relationships, I say horse feathers. But I, I should be able to fill out my tax return without hiring an accountant. I'm telling you, with a PhD, I have no idea how to do it. So <laughs> you're right, but it isn't that way. Well, John. And that's, you've already acknowledged that there's still work that needs to be done by people intramural within these places. And, and all, what you're really talking about is still the diversion of this precious dollars from frontline service. And so I think we can all agree that every system would be better if it required a minimum amount of paperwork to, to make it work, just like Peter was saying. And, you know, that's something that we constantly strive for. But, but in the meantime... Hospitals have these huge bureaucracies, even smallest town hospitals, and high-priced CEOs with, with MBAs and all sorts of graduate degrees. What the heck is going on that they have to hire you to deal with the government? They're running their hospitals. And, you know, sometimes hospital CEOs, heaven forbid, actually are doctors and they spent a long time becoming doctors, and then they've learned how to manage hospital departments, but they didn't necessarily take quite so many degrees in public administration and law and have a whole bunch of years. Like all the years they got good doing operations are the years I got good working around government. And, and you know what, if they want to have a vice president, or if they want to have a government relations consultant, or if they want to have a director, I, I just think the important point is that the tasks get done as efficiently as possible. That's what the Auditor General would want. Peter. And I was a little disappointed with the auditor's report. I, I like the fact that he spent a lot of time looking at the procurement process because there are issues and there should be compliance and the rules can go further and all of that I'm sure we all agree on. The part that uh, troubles me a little bit is considering value for money. A lot of these institutions with their own independent boards that govern them are in the process of trying to get more for their cause. So increased uh, monies for students or, or better health care. 
was the $30,000 they spent by hiring someone in order to help them shape an idea or a message or to get a community group involved, was that useful? Did it actually generate a revenue? That conversation wasn't had. We've, we've gotten to, it's almost as though the auditor's a philosopher king. He also tried, underlined junkets, junkets to Singapore, boozy, yeah. expensive dinners. Come on, with public not, dollars, not with health dollars. Yeah, yeah. Not, 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 lobbyists consultants. and consultants. No, no, what, we don't what, know what those consultants no, or lobbyists as well. No, no, actually you do. From the report, if you read it carefully, those, that there was no suggestion that the junketeering stuff was happening in the lobbyist yeah, section right. of the report. Okay, okay before... We only saw the highlight. We only saw the tip of the iceberg because he didn't audit every hospital in the province. What we right. saw was a fraction of what's going on. Be before Peter Cormos was comparing lobbyists to prostitutes a few minutes ago, no. the question I was trying to get out... Steve, and I'll put I didn't it say that. You just said uh, there have been other vices around for a long time. And I don't know, maybe my, my mind went there. What, what were you thinking? My God, What Steve, were you thinking? I'm embarrassed now. <laughs> okay. I'm so sure you're lawyers. I, <laughs> that's right, that's right. Okay, let me try this with you, Adam. Even if you did try to ban this practice, mm -hmm. there's lots of folks who say, look, it's just going to happen on the golf course. Okay, it's not going to happen in the minister's office. It'll happen during, you know, during a game of golf. Is that right? There's a danger of that. And this is what I was getting at before uh, about the problem of whether you're registered as a lobbyist, whether you're not registered as a lobbyist. And we haven't even figured out yet quite how to enforce that, I don't think. I mean, there is a, it is compulsory to, to register if you're going to lobby. We don't know how to prove that. And when we're talking about evaluating the value that, that we're getting out of these contracts, often we haven't figured out how to measure that either. Uh, so that's a real danger. And I, I do worry that I mean, if, if you're striving for a more transparent system, uh, I do worry a bit that we seem to be veering toward targeting heavily the people who are actually following the rules, more or less. Um, and I'm not sure what we're doing about, uh, about the people who aren't. And I don't even know how you target that. It's a big challenge. But I'm not sure I want to create more of them. Nelson, that's an interesting point. You know, the people who actually follow the rules are the ones who are seriously targeted by this, and if you don't want to follow the rules and skirt yeah. them, you're going to be scot-free. Yeah. That is an irony, wouldn't you agree? Right, and we're finding this out in Ottawa. Like trying to regulate campaign finances, election finances, regulating lobbyists, you, can, you keep on changing the rules, and there are always ways. It's like Greece. It'll work its way through. What I'm disturbed by, as I hear John and... Um, and respectfully, John and Peter, is this talk about the increasing complexity and why specialists are needed from the private sector. What's the next step? In-house, in-house, are we going to have bureaucrats hiring private sector lobbyists to deal with other bureaucrats in the same government? Because that's sort of, in Can a I way, what's that? going John, on here. Is that the logical extension of the argument? Well. I mean, right now you certainly have uh, major public institutions hiring public sector management consultants. You have them hiring external uh, legal counsel. You have them hiring external uh, uh, accountants. Uh, if there is somebody who can add value on a particular subsystem of government externally, then I think it's worth considering. Uh, but the, but the, it's always about value for money. And if the value for money is there, then uh, respectfully, I don't think it's a problem. If it, if it isn't there, then frankly, it's not going to last very long. we got a minute and change here, and let me go to Adam Radwanski with this. Uh, you pointed out maybe a half an hour ago that uh, we're about to enter silly season, right? Mm -hmm. we got uh, T minus 12 months and counting till the next Ontario election. And naturally, if you're the incumbent government looking for a third successive majority government, you might want to try and clear the decks and get as much controversial stuff off your plate as possible. Has this debate become too emotional to be done rationally? I think there's, I don't think it's been done rationally. I don't know if it's emotional is not the word I'd use necessarily. I'd say political might be the word I would use. I think this kind of quick solution, I mean, I remember hearing from people in the government a couple of months ago when it was known there was a lot of stuff coming down, largely submitted by Peter's party. There was, well, NDP had done a bunch of freedom of information requests. It was, it was coming down. Liberal said, yeah, we're going to have to do something about this. Uh, so it's not a reaction to a, to a problem. And I don't think they evaluated the scale of the problem. So if the issue is, why is there demand for this? They're not addressing that. Uh, why, do, why do hospitals feel compelled to hire these people? They're not addressing that. They're, they're kind of melding platitudes about how uh, they're accessible and you can just call the minister and all of that. Um, I don't, uh, finding a broad solution to change in the culture of government, if that's the intent, is going to take years and years to do. It's not going to be done by one minister. Uh, in time for the next election. In time for the next election. Gotcha. Okay, that's the last word. Can I thank all of our guests for a very nice civilized discussion about a rather contentious topic tonight? Peter Cormos. The New Democrat MPP from Welland, Nelson Wiseman, the political scientist at the University of Toronto. And on the other side of the table, from right to left, Adam Radwanski, the Globe and Mail, Peter Constantino, University of Toronto Scarborough, John Matheson, Strategy Corp. Thanks, gentlemen. Appreciate it.